This is Guitar Business Radio. Now, we've been hit pretty hard. We don't know what all the damage is yet, and we're not out of the woods. But one thing seems to be getting clearer by the day. It's time to hit the road. I'm Jeffrey D. Brown. So once again, let's get to it as we cover the road back to the business of guitar. Welcome to episode 81 of GBR. This is the third show of our new season, which I've labeled The Road Back to the Business of Guitar. And by the way, some have told me that it should be the way forward and not backward. So let me just be clear about this. It's not backward. The road back is the road forward. We need to get back to that. And just as a point of reference, for those of you listening on another time continuum, it's mid-July 2020 here on Earth. And by the way, does anyone know how we came up with the name for the planet Earth? I mean, I should know this. I'm sure I should know this. I'm sure I learned it in school or somewhere along the line, but it escapes me at the moment. I really hadn't thought about that until just a few minutes ago, but I guess I'm going to have to do some research on that when I have some free time. But if you know something about that, let me know. I'm sure there's many different answers out there. Maybe we'll give a prize to the best answer as determined solely by us under rules and regulations developed by us at a time and place developed by us. You know how that goes. At any rate, my original point was to point out that the road back was not going to be and has turned out not to be bump free. There are definitely bumps as we speak. And truthfully, there's a lot of stuff going on right now that, in my own opinion, is very questionable. On top of that, as I've said before, we're less than four months out from a national election. And I think that in itself adds another layer of questionableness to much of what's happening. Unfortunately, I'm afraid we're just not going to have a lot of answers until we're much further down the road. In the meantime, things are just getting hotter. And on another note, my special guest today is Jason Fellman, who first appeared on GBR on episode 58 in March of last year, 2019. I wanted to bring him back on the show because he's in a business that has been particularly hard hit, and that's live events. And for many years, Jason has created a thriving organization built around producing music festivals, promoting hundreds of tribute bands, booking acts, and even as a player himself and several tribute bands. And in my interview with him today, Jason talks candidly about how events of 2020 have impacted his business while sharing his views on the future of the industry as a whole and what he sees as the upside to all this. It's a good story. I think you'll all get something good out of it for yourself. As usual, following the interview, I invite you to join me at the back of the show where, once again, I'll be searching for something provocative and controversial to share with you. Of course, whatever I come up with will be subject to your own interpretation, which could vary widely depending on your own predispositions, biases, prejudices, preconceived notions, or political views. Especially if you just spent the last three hours arguing your point on social media with people who, sadly, have nothing better to do. Well, once again, I have the pleasure of uh, having somebody on the show that's been here before uh, that uh, I found extremely interesting. The first time I interviewed him, he's got a great business, uh, has for a long time up in the Pacific Northwest working with all kinds of talent and festivals and booking and uh, promoting and uh, just a lot of neat stuff. And I thought it would just be great to have him back on the show. And I'm talking about Jason Feldman. Jason, welcome back to GBR. And how are you? Ah, Doing well. It's great to be back. And uh, it's kind of uh, nice to be able to check in and uh, catch up and uh, talk about what's going on. Yeah, well, there's a lot going on. (laughs) Yeah, not not dumb. (laughs) Uh, So what we're doing now is, is we really want to talk about what's been happening in the last few months since all this stuff started happening. Uh, I don't think any of us saw it coming. 
and uh, we've kind of been thrown into it. So first off, I want to get a sense of uh, of what's been going on with you. Uh, let's say this year, I know you uh, uh, had some interesting stuff uh, with your company in the early part of the year um, in terms of uh, some mergers and things like that, at least part of it. And then we had this uh, a pandemic. So uh, why don't you bring us up to date and uh, let us know what's been happening? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, uh, I guess, to, to, as you mentioned, you know, um, I, I previously had two businesses. One was uh, the festival business, which uh, um, runs Hair Fest, a tribute band festival, and the Wild Hair Country Festival, which is uh, Red Dirt slash um, uh, alt, uh, slash Americana, you know, Roots mm-hmm. Country. Yeah. And uh, real, you know, uh, actual bands, not tributes. And then um, my the other business was JFL Presents, which does uh, you know promotes about 500 concerts a year. And then uh, also a, a booking agency, which I have spun out of JFL Presents and merged with Sterling Talent, um, which at the time before the merger was the largest. Um, or actually second, second largest independent booking uh, agency in Portland. Mine was actually, I guess, number one size wise. Right. But anyway, so we, we merged and became 50, 50 partners in that business. So um, the three companies were kind of humming along at the beginning of the year. And of course, as everybody knows, um, the COVID extravaganza hit and um, that uh, along with the rest of the industry pretty much took everything to what I call revenue zero. Yeah. So, um, you know, both festivals canceled, um, and uh, every show that as a promoter that I have booked um, has been canceled for many months. There's still a few stragglers on the books for July, August, September and beyond. Um, but obviously not a lot of confidence that those are going to maintain their existing schedule. So uh, and then as a booking agent, you know, um, again, you know, countless hundreds and hundreds of shows, you know, we book most of the, the major summer concert series, municipal summer concert series here with all the parks uh, and, uh, um, you know, countless events throughout the Northwest. And um, it's, it's, I think we're probably, you know, at 99.5% cancellation there for July and August um, and June, um, which are historically, you know, represent about 70% of the annual revenue for the working musician. Yeah. Uh, so um, that's the state of affairs, right? Um Aside from that, you know, I would say that the the aside from all the obvious, you know, number of people that are out of work, you know, the musicians, I mean, and all that. I mean, when you think about impact, you know, ultimately, outside of the festival business, um, you know, we don't own a whole lot that has an ongoing liability. So it's not I mean, we lose our business, but we also don't have a lot of expenses to maintain. Sure. The people I think who are really in the biggest struggle and in our futures are tied together. All of us in the music business are the independent music venues. Um, because they're the, you know, ultimately the first to have to have closed and they will be the last to be able to open. Um, and restaurants aren't too far behind. So I think, you know, you know, just to kind of bring it all together, everything's canceled. Independent music venues are in trouble. I'm okay. <laughs> it's kind of, I guess the big three. <laughs> well, now. you know, um, lots of people are okay. I'm okay uh, because I've built my business uh, from my home studio, home office complex, uh, overlooking water. Can't say what water it is, but uh, lots of people have sort of continued on and continued working. There's a big percentage of people that are not working. And for those people and those businesses, uh, it's a big problem and it does affect a lot of other people. And there's a domino effect, uh, I would say. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, um, the and I, I think it's a, it's, it's very uh, a good parallel is also the live events industry. So like even like people who do weddings, right? Sure. Uh, or, you know, or corporate events, I mean, any, any number of different things um, uh, are all sort of tied to the same kind of fate, which is if your business or if you sport tech, if you rely on a large gathering, the entire ecosystem from uh, talent entertainers, right. To the accountants, to the production people, the support staff, the security staff, the concession staff. I mean, it's amazing how many jobs are created through businesses that rely on large crowds. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a, it's a, it's a bitter pill, um, with, with no, you know, demonstrable end in sight. I hate to say it. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, you can look at it, you know, from a sort of a 
a drone position <laughs> uh, or um, you can look at it as kind of a, a day-to-day kind of thing. And uh, if you're looking at the bigger picture and taking a negative view of it, that can be kind of depressing. If, uh, on the other hand, uh, you take the positive side and uh, looking at it more on a day-to-day basis and uh, seeing a positive direction or destination down the road, maybe a little easier to to stomach along the way, but for people who are dealing with real-time issues, of which there are many, it's a bit of a distraction. So, you know, tell me what you're seeing. Well, that's the interesting thing about it is like, you know, if uh, this is a... Uh, this is where I think that if you, you know, being an entrepreneur in general um, has its challenges um, if you care about people. Um, you know, the good news is there, you know, essentially there are two ways to win or be successful, right? Mm-hmm. One of them is the win lose model where, you know, you believe that in order for you, know, you to win, someone has to lose, right? Yeah. Criminals, athletes, you know, you, you can't win a game without beating somebody else. But entrepreneurs, thankfully, the other model is to win with others winning along with you. You know what I mean? Sure. And so, um, you know, really good entrepreneurs tend to have a tree. You know, the, the bazillionaires also have a trail of millionaires aside of them. So, um, so anyway, I, where I'm going with this is that the, on the human side, right? I really, it's really difficult to obviously see people struggle. And it's also difficult to see people um, at odds with one another. You know, no matter what you believe, you can, you know, um, you can lament that there's so much unrest and conflict and regardless of what needs to happen and all that, it's like, it's just unfortunate that that's where we are, but maybe that's just what needs to happen as an entrepreneur. Um, it's interesting because, you know, uh, you know, like with investing or with game theory or, or anything where you really kind of look at like the dynamics of, of, of success, it's like the best opportunities tend to come in the worst of times. And so the entrepreneur in me is like doing kickstands, you know what I mean? Like I, I um, you know, the, the 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 bulb is going off, and I'm just going, wow, there's just so much upside right now. Um, but that's just purely from a business standpoint. I will tell you that I would gladly trade all that potential for everybody else getting their lives back and nobody dying. So that's where I'm at. Ultimately, is I, you know, I would as much as the entrepreneur in me loves the uncertainty because it's good for business. I would trade all that if everybody could just be okay. You know what I mean? Sure. Of course. Yeah. Of course. But that's what's going on right now. So it's really hard because on the one hand, I'm like, wow, there's lots of opportunity. I mean, you know, one opportunity, one of my bass players in one of my bands that I actually perform in, it was really surprising to hear his perspective. You know, he's a guy that's historically lived paycheck to paycheck, but, you know, lately he's been saving money and stuff. But, but on top of that, you know, his viewpoint was like, what else in life at age, you know, 40 something to 50 something or, you know, whatever, are you going to get six to 12 months to work on yourself? Yeah. You know, yeah. whether it's a skill or a business or a project or whatever. Right. So I don't want to discount the fact that, you know, you still have to make ends meet, but you know, to varying degrees, there are opportunities that come along with this. And that's one of them. So anyway, I mean, that's, that's kind of what the views like. I, I don't let this get me down because I'm an optimist, but uh, I mean, obviously it's, it bums me out to see people suffering. Right. So when you talk about you're jumping up and down with all of the uh, potential opportunities, and I understand how that works. Tell me uh, if you can about some of those potential opportunities without compromising any trade secrets or uh, plans that might, uh, you know, yeah, spoil no, I mean, it. But I, I'm, I'm interested I, if you can. Yeah. Well, I can give you, uh, I can give you a couple, you know, without naming names, I can give you some, you know, some pretty good insight on this one. So um, on the one end, uh, there are events that we have been wanting to, you know, larger, you know, festival sized things that we've been wanting to get into in our festival business that, um, you know, on the one hand, yeah, we really, you know, we've taken our lumps in the past and it was tough to have to like cancel uh, uh, by the same token. Um, you have a lot more time to work on ideas. Uh, and the other one is that artists um, are suddenly a lot more flexible, you know, even for things that are, they're a year out. You know, the, the industry, di- the, the industry dynamic um, when it comes to booking has changed, you know, um, I think it's brought the balance of uh, 
influence better into better balance. You know, I think we were in this sort of situation where, you know, this, you were either, you either in a situation where the promoter has like all the power and the bands are screwed, you know, have just have to do whatever. And then you had the opposite thing happening where, you know, you've got, you know, in some situations more at a higher level, like the artist has all the power and the promoter doesn't have enough. Mm -hmm. And so what I would say is that in both cases, it's probably, especially at the, at the higher end. So at the festival level, when you're dealing with like real touring artists, you know, charting artists kinds of things, um, it's just gotten a little more sane at the negotiating table all of a sudden. Yeah, uh, I can see that. So, um, and, you know, I also, and I think there's an awakening that comes along with that, which is that we as event producers, together with the artist, together with the artist management, together with the artist booking agency, everybody sees this. We all saw what happens when we lose everything. So I think there's maybe a little bit more of a spirit of collaboration moving forward and saying, hey, you know what? Let's keep give each other some flexibility because we're all going to need this to get back on our feet. And so I, I guess, it, you know, again, kind of looking in a more positive light, even though we're all, you know, the artists have lost their opportunities, agents aren't earning commissions and, you know, event producers can't produce their events. In some respects, it's brought us closer together. It, it, it's even on the booking side. It's been amazing, like how much our relationships have grown with our clients because of the trust that was built. Like, for example, like a lot of our clients came to us, thought they thought they were going to lose their deposits. So when they found out that, that we had protected their deposits or that the artists were just super cool about it, then all of a sudden the conversation has shifted. They're like, wow, that's so, so cool. How about we just go ahead and move forward with booking them for the next year for the same event and just have them keep the deposit. I mean, things like that are happening like all the time now. So even though the benefit might not come for a year out, those relationships are deeper and it's going to open more doors to more types of bookings when we can do it. So that's, you know, that's one of the examples of opportunity. The other one, without getting too long winded about it, is just quite simply that money is cheap right now. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. Interest rates are so low. So if you're looking at making any types of investments from a business standpoint, um, you know, if you're looking at that type of thing, obviously there are some interesting opportunities. If, um, so, yeah, I mean, those, those are some of the more specific things. So I think, you know, ironically, as events are being canceled, it's not a bad time to be planning new ones. One of the things I like to talk about, because in my own experience, uh, I, you know, and you uh, being kind of a positivity guy like like me, tend to look at the things that are uh, coming out of crisis situations like this, uh, there's always a lot of positives. And, and um, you know, sometimes they're apparent early on and sometimes they're more apparent later on. But when you can identify those things and, and focus on them, it, it's kind of a, a good way to, to, to keep that positive uh, direction going. And I'm kind of wondering if, if you see those kinds of, of changes happening in and around your industry uh, that are going to go forward, that are going to be real positive uh, components um, going down the road. I mean, you've, you've illustrated some, but are any of those apparent to you both in your personal business and across the industry? I mean, on the personal side, how I kind of describe it is, you know, without getting too philosophical, is that, you know, your positive energy is sort of like the alternator in your car. You know what I mean? Like you're, you, you, it, it helps sort of fuel the, it, it develops, you know, creates energy that you can use at other times. And so what I always want to be careful of is not sort of burying my head in the sand and saying, Hey, see, look at all the great things happening right now. Cause obviously there's horrible. I think it's more a matter of, did you take all those great things and recognize them and let them give you the fuel to fight the crappy stuff. So Rather than just, you know, rather than just taking a straight up victim mentality and say, oh, this all sucks. It's like, no, no, no. There's some good stuff over happening here. So I'm, I'm going to feel that. I'm going to take that energy. And I'm going to go kick ass on these things that really do suck. In terms of like how people are dealing with things, um, what I've observed is you've got three very different types of it, you're really learning a lot about the people around you. Fortunately for my own business, it's validated the overwhelming majority of my business relationships. I mean, I'm just you know, every single day, I'm like, gosh, I'm so glad I'm working with this person, or I'm so glad that this person's my partner through this. I mean, that's all I find myself saying. I mean, I'm really, really, that's not lip service. I really feel lucky about that. 
Um, cause I, I got, you know, whether it's the, the, you know, the, the people that I pay to do social media or the people who run my merch or my actual, you know, equity business partners or product, I mean, everybody's just been so amazing. So, but essentially you got, you sort of learn that there's sort of three different ways that people approach this. One of them is the sort of straight up like victim mentality where it's just, it's not, it's a lot of complaining and sort of negative self-talk and this is never going to end and looking for someone to blame constantly and all that. Right. And that's one way of approaching it. And then one is sort of a neutral, like, well, well this is bad, but you know, I'm just going to hunker down and, and, and just try to get through it until we come out the other side, you know? And I think a lot of people fall into that category and I'm not saying any of these are right or wrong, but then you've got probably the smallest, but really fascinating and exciting group of people is the folks who like somehow use this as a transformative opportunity. Um, I know there's a local artist here. I mean, I'm going to use his name. His name's JP Downer. He's one of the best bass players in town, but he's obviously not gigging right now, but he's also a really good artist. And it seems like in no time, the guy has like launched this whole brand with shirts and cups and art. And he's, he's doing everybody's artwork and he's just making things happen. You know what I mean? Sure. And I'm just going, wow, man, this is a guy that like, he just, he stepped up to it, said, I'm going to make this happen. And so, and I'm seeing things like that happening too. And I think that's, you know, when I was talking about how, you know, great entrepreneurs tend to thrive in the worst of times, you know, you're seeing those people rise up and maybe that wouldn't have happened otherwise, you know, maybe it took something like this to bring that out of some of us. So that's another thing. You know, one of the things that we have to, to deal with is uh, a perception of things. Uh, if you're somebody who pays a lot of attention to news and media and stuff like that. You know, you get one sense of things. It isn't always good. Uh, mostly it's not good. Uh, right. It's geared toward, uh, you know, views and clicks and, you know, metrics and stuff like that. And headlines don't always correspond to what's in the story. And so, you know, that has one effect. Then uh, there are some of those people who are not really paying attention to that and, and living what seems like an entirely different life. I wanted to just kind of ask you a little bit about that in terms of, you know, do you hear those kinds of things? Do you pay attention to what's going on in, say, media? Or do you base your perception of things somewhere else? Uh, it's a mix, to be honest. I mean, I, 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 I like to fancy myself as someone who looks at the at the my, my view as being somewhat holistic. Um, you know, um, I, I try never to get too high or too low. I try not to, to react to things like I've I'm also a big fan of game theory. So, you know, I believe if everybody's going one way, I should probably be going the other. <laughs> um, but but also, you know, I've re I've re managed to reduce my sort of outlook and, on, you know, and how I want to approach information and people into two things, right? Number one is the goal and the rule. That's a great place to start, right? Yeah. Um, and then the second one is the scientific method of problem solving. There, there you go. I like um, that one too. <laughs> yeah. And so I think, you know, I, I, I haven't like, and again, this isn't like, you know, I'm not really qualified to go too far with this, but I think like, I feel like if you use those two things as, as your sort of, um, as your, your guide, your compass, your litmus test, whatever, or your, your filter for, for input, I think that's a, uh, you're, you're going to get a, get a pretty good answer, you know, as to what you need to do or think or say. Um, and, and part of the reason why I like the scientific method is because it's, it's never done. You know what I mean? You know, e even if you prove a hypothesis, you, it can, with new information, it can be disproven. You know what I mean? So it's just like, the reason I like to talk about the scientific method is that's not to say like, I don't necessarily mean that I'm not trying to dig at like non-science people, you know what I mean? Like disbelievers. What I mean more about that is the actual method and the mentality that says my, my knowledge of this is not absolute. And so, you know, rather than get bogged down on what ideology is correct or not correct, I rather look at it from a fundamental standpoint of like, Am I applying the right kind of thinking to this situation to try to get the best, best answer possible? And is it a compassionate choice? One that considers, would I want this done to me? You know what I mean? So I don't yeah, know. Yeah. That's, you know, it's a little, it's a little yeah. bit, you know, flighty, but I, I think those two things, if you're trying to come up with a basic lens these days without like blowing a gasket. <laughs> There's a lot of gasket blowing going on. Uh, yeah. I right think the now, other one yeah. too is like, just you have to you know, look at the, the medium and how it impacts the message. I mean, I love the line in the Sting song. There isn't a monopoly of common sense on either side of the political fence. One of my like favorite sayings because 
the, the, the goal of being right is different than the goal of being correct. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and uh, that's the problem. I think people spend too much time trying to be right and seeing things from a lens of, you know, how, what, what's going to make me right as opposed to what's going to get to the correct answer here. Yeah. So, anyway, that's a great way to, um, that's a great way to look at it. Um, tell me a little bit about your own music. I mean, I know you're a participant and you know, you work in these groups. So we talked about the, that the last time on a personal level, what are you doing uh, in that area? Oh yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. Cause that <laughs> to me, that's like been, if, if I'm looking at like upside, right. If I'm looking yeah. at the upside of all this, yeah. I've played the drum. So I'm, I'm a, my background again, for those who, who weren't in the last one, I, my, my background is I'm a professionally trained drummer. I went to PIT. Um, I'm also basically a professionally trained guitar player and, and a professional trained vocalist. Uh, I'm in three bands. I play drums in a journey tribute in a yacht rock tribute. And then I'm the lead singer slash rhythm guitarist for an eighties cover band. So, um, because of my other businesses, I, you know, I've gotten to the point where, you know, I've unfortunately chops and, 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 uh, you know, those kinds of things and, you know, musical advancement as a performer, as a musician, they've kind of taken a backseat to the development of my business. And I've kind of been lamenting that for many years. So when this all hit, I was like, man, so I, I'm playing drums for like at least an hour a day. And, um, you know, that, that's not, I, I was lucky before if I played drums in between gigs, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so actually like spending time with the metronome, working on rudiments, uh, uh, teaching my daughter guitar, you know, um, you know, all the, the, the things that time for me this is the first, you know, I've got a 13 year old daughter and this is going to be the first time in 10 years that she's really going to have had me around for the summer. So yeah, I have no income. But I got a I got a solid two months with my kiddo. And that's like priceless, right? So um, you know, for me, um, I'm I'm getting a lot of time in on my instruments, and it feels good to feel like a musician again. It's it's actually really inspiring. I, I love it. I, I'm learning how to. I'm learning the technology. Like I mastered the X32. You know, I'm I'm no longer going to be the guy who has to get the gig. Say, how do I get my monitors up? I'm going to be the guy that people come to and say, how do I get my monitors up? <laughs> So I love that. So I'm, I'm empowered. I'm, I'm loving the time to spend with my family and to work on my musician and my, you know, just that side of it. That's great. Yeah. So and that's going to have a, a positive long-term effect on what you're doing, don't you think? Well, yeah, because I got, you know, all kinds of, you know, I've, all, you know, sorts of physical impediments and things. And so, you know, getting me in musical shape, you know, ongoing, um, you know, I prioritized my health through this entire thing. I didn't change my exercise regimen at all. I just went from going into the Pilates studio to doing it online. Um, you know, I walk an hour every day still. And I, you know, those, that's the foundation is the health. And, and you know what? I'm not, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on any of this stuff, but we're, we lock it down over here. We just, we take it seriously. We're, we're locked down, you know, the, if, and if we're wrong, then the worst thing we did was, you know, help other, you know, try to help somebody, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, well, I, I think you've pegged that right. I'm, I mean, I know my walking schedule has really solidified. Uh, I was pretty sporadic before and, and that's something I have to do and we all should be doing. Um, so this has allowed us to solidify fortify one of the one of those words uh better habits uh, it's given yeah. us the time to you know put those things into routine status when so many times you know they're they're sporadic some things have to become routine and you just have to be able to do it for a while and be committed to it and then if you don't do it something's wrong you feel it your body tells you you know you gotta you gotta go out and do it so I think you know, there's also been a lot of I mean, much lip service and, and, and rightly so has been given to this sort of uh, um, idea of like because of, you know, when you're not working and when you're spending a lot of time at home and stuff like having some sort of routine, the benefits of that and all that. I, I think there's something to be said for that as well. So, that, you know, just the, the doing, you know. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing, too, is that I know down here in Southern California, I know we've been more open now for about a month or so. And, uh, you know, it's still a little iffy, but going to back to the restaurant, you know, safely, we made the determination it was okay. And uh, th the point is that when you go without something for a while, and we've gone up without a lot of things, especially stuff that you never were really without, you always sort of took it for granted. It changes your 
view on those things. And all of a sudden, they're treats again. They're something special. And uh, as opposed to just, well, we go out on Friday nights, we go out on Sunday. It's just a regular thing that we do and you don't think about it. Now it's like, wow, this is this is great. This is a big deal. It's important the way it used to be when, yeah, we get to go out, <laughs> you know. I mean, even like, you know, because, you know, because we, I mean, just like other people, you know, I'm not immune to this. You know, we, when we discovered we weren't going to have any income, we looked at our spending, you know, so, uh, you know, one of the first things to go was the eating out. Right. I mean, and even deliveries, like we could have had, we could have gotten delivery every night if we want to, but it would be really expensive. So, you know, we changed our habit there and it's been a good thing financially, but, but then to your point, we, you know, after maybe a month or so, we ordered a pizza for delivery and, you know, that used to be the thing. It's like the emergency order. Like, oh, we better get pizza tonight. Man, that was best average pizza I have ever had. <laughs> and all of a sudden it's like it was it was just. Yeah, you're right. It was average. But well, now it's yeah, it was so fan- good. this is fantastic. Yeah. You know? Wow. Amazing. <laughs> Average never tastes so good. (laughs) So those are good things. And, you know, uh, I've had those experiences even before this under other circumstances. I've lived long enough to have uh, ups and downs where, you know, where you come back from being down and you get something back that you didn't have for a while. Uh, I've noticed that I haven't forgotten that. So those things that I might have gone without for a while when I got them back. I never took them for granted again. I mean, it was, yes. you, you know, yeah. you sort of got it, but you don't take it for, for granted. And um, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. That changes uh, how we see ourselves and our experience, you know. And I always tell people that uh, there's always more good things going on in a day than there are bad things. And yep. maybe sometimes there's one really nasty, bad thing, but there's 30 small, good things. And when you, I at times have listed those things, just made lists when I felt like I needed to, to make sure I was, you know, in that sort of positive realm. I'd start listing every little thing that happened in a particular day that was positive, even the smallest thing. And, you know, the list is, gets really, really long. And it's really amazing what that what that does for you. And it makes that one thing that kind of went south seem like, okay, well, that's just one thing, you know? So it sounds to me like you have that kind of uh, view and that, and that really gives us a better path forward. Don't you think? Yeah. You know, the other thing I learned, this is one thing I, I, you're always going to hear me go back to poker and game theory and that type of stuff, because it's so informative. You know, one of the things you learn in a, a game like poker, where, it's a it's a game of short term luck and long term skill. So, you know, you, you're, the whole thing is built around decision making. And so, what, what what you learn when you when you play lots of poker and you're analytical about it is that you realize that you can't let uh, a, a bad luck uh, color uh, make take a good decision to make it bad. You know what I mean? Yeah. You can make a good decision and still have a bad outcome. And what you learn in poker is that you learn not to to get focused on the ones you lose because you learn this. It's the word is like, it's a continuum, you know? Um, And I think that, you know, that applies to life as well. And to your point, it's like, well, yeah, if you were to plot all the points on the continuum of the day, there would be a few of, you know, unless you get in a car accident, stabbed or murdered, you know, or you find out you had cancer that day. It's like in general, you know, you're going to see a few low points and the rest of it are going to be pretty high unless, and what's even more interesting, by the way, is if you look at those points and you ask the question, which one of these could I have could I have had influence over? If you know if the answer was spent three hours wallowing in bed, well, you could have actually done something with that time. Um, <laughs> you, you can't blame that one on the president. Yeah, um, you yeah know, that's right. There's a, you know, whatever. You know, it's uh, it's interesting. Yeah, but you know, all of this again, it's easy for a guy like me to say when I'm not scrapping for my meal. So I, I also I always want to be mindful of that. It's, you know. I got a lot of big philosophies and ideas, but I'm not the guy, you know, paycheck to paycheck at this moment, you know, so I, you know, I gotta, gotta also be mindful of that. Well, one of the things uh, that I heard yesterday from, uh, from uh, Jamie Gale uh, was that, uh, you know, we really need to think about our own supply chain, whether it's, um, you know, your business, uh, your industry, your personal life. I mean, I hadn't really thought about I always thought about supply chain as kind of a business thing, but I think it's a personal thing too. I think we have our own personal supply chains, right? You know, and uh, a lot of times in business, you're sometimes only as good as your supply chain. 
and your supply chain, you have partners and people that you're affiliated with in some capacity. Uh, and we have to think about those relationships and, and, and those people and make sure that we're all in good shape because, uh, you know, I'm not a collectivist in that regard, but, you know, I think that if there are things that we can do, and I agree with him that, uh, you know, if we can help raise the tide uh, for all ships, then especially those ships in our supply chain, we all do better, you know? So, and I think, I think supply chains, I think the whole supply chain thing idea has really uh, had some heightened awareness in these last few months. I think uh, what's interesting about it, I mean, it's really fascinating you brought that up. You know, I, haven't, I haven't heard that mentioned yet, but it does make sense to me. So the interesting thing about supply chains is that we, when we think about supply chains, we often think about like, you know, vertical you know, integration. So, you know, starts, you know, starts from the cow, comes out, goes to the middle, goes here, you know what I mean? And, um, but the, but the thing about like live music, and I, I mentioned this earlier when we were talking about, about venues, it's like music is interesting because it's really more like, it's a big, it's like a web of horizontal integration. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so what's interesting about that with, with everything kind of running through, uh, big hubs, uh, you know, JP Downer, the guy I mentioned did a great graphic. I'll share it with you when we're done here in case it's worth sharing to your folks. It's a really interesting thing where it shows the relationships between the various, you know, everything from media to security to production staff. And so I think one of the reasons why there's so much, so much focus right now on, um, the fate of independent music venues is because, Th those are the ones that are going to go down and you know and i don't i'm not i'm not like an anti-live nation guy so i don't want to come off like that in fact live nation's the clients i don't i don't want to i don't want to be that guy but it, it i would say it like this you wouldn't want walmart and no small businesses and that's not even fair because i think live nation is you know you would you wouldn't want it, live nation's not walmart they're a higher end brand you know what i mean you wouldn't want whatever the higher end version of, you know, you want a large business and a bunch of small businesses to keep things in balance. That's my point. Yep. And so if all the independent venues go down, what happens is like I was talking about earlier, you know, people in business look at times right now for opportunities. If you are a cash rich uh, entity um, or, you know, one with lots of uh, lo leverage, you can get money for really cheap, right? You know, Live Nation probably has billions of dollars of assets that they can borrow against at sickly low interest rates to pick up all these venues that are basically going to be bought out of distress and a bankruptcy. And yeah. so, um, and, and open their, in fact, they don't even need those. They can just let them die and then pick up the space. And um, it's not that I don't want, you know, Live Nation to succeed. It's that I want, we need to have that balance maintained. I, I, I really don't think that enough is being made of this particular issue. It is the fulcrum of live music in America right now. And it is severely at risk because the governments at, at most levels are not doing anything for them. Well, uh, I mean, I'm careful to step into, uh, you know, a political quicksand. But, you know, it, you brought up a, an interesting point with big versus small. And, you know, in these in these lockdowns, we had most of the big box stores were open and people go in and be crowded in and whatnot. And yet the smaller businesses that did something very similar were not allowed to be open. Now, I, this, this is a debatable thing. And, you know, I'm, like I said, I don't want to get into a political debate on it. But, but it sounds to me like that's, there's a very similar situation, kind of a parallel there. And I don't know how you... Well, yeah, they're, they're, subject it, to the, but... yeah, they're, they're subject to the same forces. And I think, you know, I've thought about this a lot, right? Because um, for the same reason that everybody else has. And where I tend to land on it, which is a fairly apolitical view, because, again, I'm the, fortunately for me, I have equal disdain for the Republican president and our, and the Democratic governor here locally. So clearly I don't have a side. You know what I mean? I, my issues are ethics and competence. Th that will get a good result. I don't care about big government versus small government. And in, the, in what you're talking about, I think that one thing I think most people can agree on, we may disagree on why, but I think we all agree that uh, there is an unevenness to the approach um, of, of – um, of fighting the virus. You know what I mean? I think that's where a lot of frustration comes from. And I think that's viable. You know, whether you believe that this is the, this thing is going to, you know, is the most deadly thing ever and it's going to kill everybody who gets it, or whether you believe it's a complete hoax, that's sort of separate from, it's undeniable that there's a lot of inconsistency. I mean, you can look at the protests too. I totally support the protests. 
I'm cool with all that. I also think it's fair to say, well, wait a minute, these people are gathering. How come we can't gather? Right. So I get that. I understand the criticism. I'm not taking sides on it, yeah. but it's a fair, I think it's fair to say that things are inconsistent. And I think that when I sort of talk about lack of leadership at the, at the government level, the reason I sort of make it in an apolitical way is that ultimately if, if we have the right type of leadership, then what we would do is we would see um, messaging at every level that was you know unifying and inspirational and encouraging. And we would see approaches you know at, a, at an implementation level that are uh, consistent and non-discriminatory. You know what I mean? So that, that's how I guess I would kind of look at that at more of a systems level and, and, yeah. and speak to it regardless yeah. of political. Ideas. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. And I, you know, and I'm very vocal about the fact that I've I've always been an independent and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm more principle and issue focused and, uh, you know, I, I can piss off people on the left and the right just as easily. So it's not hard. It's not hard to do these days. People are very agitated. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. But I, but I think that, you know, there's, there's not a lot of principle and, uh, you know, you gotta have some, you gotta have some stake in the ground. You gotta have, you gotta operate yeah. from principle and uh, principles go out go out the window in politics and uh, never been a fan. But it is but it is what it is. We can all do our part uh, to come from principle, uh, to come from love rather than hate and all of those kinds of things that make the world a better place. I want to ask you uh, before we close this out, you know, and I think I'm going to ask everybody this question is what kind of a personal message you know, do you have for your industry? And, and if it's for humanity in general, that's fine. But but I'm interested to hear what you would like to say uh, to the people around you as we go through all this. And as we try to, I say the road back, some people say the road forward. For me, it's the same thing. Uh, what do you have to say on it? Yeah, I mean, I guess my sort of number one thought process for all things, you know, when, when you to the extent you can. Right. Because I have to qualify that saying is that some me some needs are immediate food, shelter. I mean, there's some things medicine are immediate. But in general, the, the best thing I think that anyone can do, e even in the best of times, is to apply long term thinking to the situation. Um, and so. You know, the reality is that let's say, for example, that you're someone who, again, believes this this is the just, you know, complete hoax. Right. Well, you might be right. All right. Maybe you're right. But you know what? You're not. You have to be pragmatic about it. You're not going to get at least half the population to believe that. Right. <laughs> so you're bet So if you care about your long term interests rather than fight it, just, you know, suck it up for a couple of months. We would have been done already if everybody would have sucked it up. Just suck it up. You can say, I told you so at the end of it or whatever, who cares? But like, just, you know, you have to think about it pragmatically being right or wrong won't change the outcome. So <laughs> the reality is even if you're right, you're still better off. Even if you're somebody who believes this is a hoax, you're still better off hunkering down because you can't argue that things will go slower that way. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, it's like, no, it's just, I think that makes a lot of sense. There's, so there's only one rational way forward. Even if, even if you think that it's a conspiracy at this point, you know, yeah. Well, uh, as I've said before, uh, the, an election year couldn't have come at the worst time. <laughs> you know? uh, so it, it kind of makes everything for everybody suspicious. And I mean, or from, a better, you know, more yeah. better time, right? Because then you know, the other the other thought process is here is that you know what? I mean, I, and I definitely think this is true when it comes to the Black Matter, Black Lives Matter movement, and and uh, for race equality in general. It's like I, I was telling a friend, like you know, I think this is a great time. Right. Because, you know, it's like, if not now, when it's like, if we're going to shake it up, let's do it. Let's, you know, if we're going to make change, let's do it. Let's go. Let's just get into the change mindset and let's just rip the bandaid off and get things right. You know, and then we can get on to the business of living. Well, I, so. you know, I think you got a lot. I think you got a lot going for you. And uh, there's a lot ahead for all of us, uh, maybe uh, more for you than me, but maybe not. I don't know. Um, and, uh, you know, it'll be interesting uh, to see where we are in six months. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll just have to revisit this at that time or shortly afterwards and see how far we've come and see how things uh, shook out, as as you say. But, yeah, it's going to be fascinating. You know, things like the interviews now, are they're becoming the time capsules. You know what yeah, I mean? So it's really yeah. fascinating. 
see how that bears out. I agree. It would be fun to reconnect in six months and see what has come to fruition one way or another. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I think this is a good time to be doing it. And I do appreciate you taking the time to come back on the show, uh, Jason. And uh, I wish you all the best in your endeavors. That's usually what they say when they fire you. But um, yeah, you know, it's like <laughs> I, already lo- I, already, I already lost my job. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I hope you'll stay in touch and I look forward to the next time. Be well. Yeah, you too. Well, Jason always has a lot to say, and he's a passionate and engaged guy with a positive point of view. I like the discussion of the win-lose model versus the win-win approach, which is something we've always advocated on this program. Another important point was recognizing the value of collaboration and how the events of this year may very well be encouraging much more of that kind of business activity on many fronts. He also identified the problem with independent venues and how things may change permanently for so many of them, but not always in a bad way, hopefully. All in all, a terrific interview. If you've not already listened to my previous interview with Jason, travel back to episode 58 and you'll hear a different story, but not without the same level of enthusiasm and positivity. And if you have any questions or thoughts on any of this, we always want to hear from you. You can do that through multiple channels on our website, at guitarbusinessradio.com and on Facebook and Twitter at Guitar Business by email at contact at guitarbusinessradio.com or you can easily call our GBR hotline at 888-777-2404. Operators are standing by with their masks on so even if you do call you'll be able to understand about half of what they say. But don't get me wrong, masks are great. We love them. We wear them. I'm just wondering what this new mask industry will look like a year from now. We'll follow that closely, and we'll keep you updated. Well, that's about it for this show. We're producing another group of shows as we speak, and those should start appearing in the next week or so as we follow a little looser schedule. But if you think you have a good and relevant story for us or know someone that ought to be on the show, we're always happy to hear about it, so don't be shy. And look... These may be stressful times for many of us. There's a lot going on uh, that may cause all kinds of frustration, irritation, aggravation, and maybe just plain anger. Just so you know, I think it's pretty well accepted that large doses of those kinds of feelings are generally not healthy or good for your immune system. And I've experienced those feelings from time to time myself. I sometimes find it difficult to turn them off, but you got to do it. And if miraculously we could all do it... <laughs> I'm thinking the world would be a better place. Of course, if just you do it, it will be a better place for you right now. And while you're at it, stay positive, stay focused on your destination, but always keep all the options open on how you're going to get there. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time on episode 82 of Guitar Business Radio. Guitar Business Radio.